Welcome everybody to this episode of The Green Left Show. This is the latest episode, episode number 10. Anachronistically, we're releasing episode 10 after episode 11. Um, and we're very sorry that this episode is so late to, to be released, but we will be returning to a weekly schedule uh, from, from now on. That said, actually, we are discussing which is the best day in the week to release these Green Left shows. So if you have an opinion about what you think will be best, we'd be very happy to, to see your comments about that in the, uh, in the comments below. Uh, this video or, the, or this podcast if you're listening as a podcast wherever you're coming from thanks for joining us i would like to acknowledge that this uh this green air show is being produced on stolen aboriginal land i'm coming to you from jagera turbul country uh, but wherever you are in this country it is stolen land sovereignty was never ceded and therefore it always was and always will be aboriginal land and there never will be justice for anybody in this country until there is justice for the first nations of this country that's an acknowledgement that we always make, but it's especially important today um, because the topic of this show is to stop black deaths in custody. This is especially in the context of the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody, which, was, which took place three weeks ago. We're joined by two very special guests. The first is Amanda Porter. Amanda is an academic activist of Aboriginal, uh, Brinja Yuan, and also settler, uh, Greek and English descent. She was interviewed from Nam or uh, so-called Melbourne on unceded territory of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung of the Kulin Nation. She especially wanted to acknowledge that the elders and warriors past and present who have led the way, as we reflect on what it means to acknowledge country at this particular juncture and time, may we also reflect deeply on what it means to live ethically on stolen Aboriginal land, whether, wherever we might be listening, tuning in from, and to give generously to families and local community controlled organisations at this time especially. Also joining us today is Dr. Helen Corbett. She was the co-founder and chairperson of the former National Committee to Defend Black Rights in Australia. This was one of the organisations, in fact, one of the key organisations that pushed very hard in a 10 year long campaign to actually achieve the Royal Commission uh, in the first place. And uh, thanks, yeah, thanks to both Amanda and Helen for joining us today. As I said, the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission was three weeks ago. Uh, in that time, like just last week alone, two Aboriginal people have died in custody, and that brings to, to the total of seven, the number of people that have, the number of Aboriginal people that have died in custody in just a two month period. So this obviously remains a very present, contemporary and important issue that we, that we, uh, that we look at today. Also in the last three weeks, we talk, we've also seen the spectacle of Anzac Day in which uh, the role of Aboriginal soldiers and veterans uh, was not acknowledged in the military adventures that Australia has taken, part in, uh, has taken part in, and especially unacknowledged was the racism that those uh, veterans returned home to. Even more so, even less acknowledgement was given to the only wars to have been fought on Australian soil, which was actually the frontier wars, the wars of resistance by Aboriginal people who fought bravely and justly to defend this country against invasion, against dispossession, against genocide, and against massacres. So, you know, there is, there is so much injustice uh, in, in relation to the First Nations of this country that, uh, that it is important we focus on this issue of deaths in custody as, as one of a number of issues of justice for Aboriginal people today. The 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission also coincided with the death of Prince Philip, and that event received saturation coverage in the corporate media which actually in itself is a violation of one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission, which were some of the recommendations were actually directed towards the media. I did ask Amanda Porter about those recommendations that have been unimplemented, and this is what she said to me. The amount of recommendations that have been unimplemented, there's, there's so many, and, and like it's, it's, it's all of them. Like that's the thing that's frustrating is that, as I said, to just pull out that example of the media, um, none of those were implemented last week because that was all about um, the importance of... Um, uh, centering narrative, centering families um, in all of this, and um, that we didn't, you know, there, I don't think I, I didn't see one, you know, that, that last week and the the thirty year anniversary is the week that you should see the work of, you know, the Day family on the front page. Um, it's the week that you should see the work of the Dajua Foundation of the Tangentiary um, Safety Patrol, the work of Aboriginal organisations at the coal front. That, that should have been front and centre in and um, capturing the nation's attention and, and that just didn't happen. So, um, but that's just one example, like uh, 
there's recommendations in relation to health about the importance of um, Aboriginal community controlled um, health organisations and, and culturally safe um, health responses. And, you know, what do we see? We see Aboriginal organisations funding gutted, um, you know, consistent kind of um, uh, is what I see rallies for, um, you know, just enough funding to survive. And we see a similar thing with um, Aboriginal legal services around um, around the nation, just, um, you know, continue uh, lobbying just to just to have funding to survive. Um, so it's a far cry from, um, you know, th the original recommendations, which was, you know, centering the importance of um, governments um, really providing um, equitable and, and fair funding for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations. Um, they're also, you know, one of the saddest things, um, fr frustrating um, and sickening things about um, reading recommendations is that, you know, there's um, recommendations that appear in those 339 recommendations. There's recommendations that you see in the individual 99 death reports, but you see these recommendations reported over and over again. So there's been 474 deaths since the Royal Commission. And it's worth noting that, you know, the you know, Royal Commission itself only investigated 99 deaths, but there were um, over 130 in the 1980s. Um, but um, back to my point, um, in the 30 years since there's been, you know, countless deaths in prison and police custody, and I should add, you know, countless deaths outside in terms of um, the harms of, of the castle state more generally. And you see these recommendations just, you know, you could draw a trace a line. You could just trace the history of this recommendation um, back in time, repeated in countless national inquiries and so on. It might be useful just to give one example. So the Royal, one of, one of the 339 recommendations related to the, um, um, I can't say the number off the top of my head, but the importance of decriminalising um, the offence of public drunkenness. Um, and, um, you know, we've known this since 1988. I think there was an interim report in the Royal Commission um, and which related to, to um, several deaths in custody about the urgent need to decriminalise public drunk, the offence of public drunkenness. Um, and um, not only did that happen you know, in 1991, when the re final report was tabled in Parliament, I mean, it happened in some states and territories, but here in the state of Victoria, um, where I'm zooming in from, um, you know, how can it be that, you know, 30 years later, um, and it's uh, it's not been because of um, we, we're only just getting there now, um, and and that's only been not because of the government the will of the of the Andrews government um, or 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 you know government bureaucrats actually doing anything. The only reason there's been any action on that has been um, thanks to the advocacy of the Day family here. And um, I mean I just don't even have words um, you know and I can't even begin to in terms of um, empathy I can't begin to imagine how they must feel um, because that recommendation appeared in the death in custody of Harrison Day um, in the original Royal Commission. Um, and then, um, who was, of course, Tanya Day's uncle. Um, so um, that, um, it, it seems, um, for me, um, the most um, uh, sickening thing of all that um, not only are governments not acting on these individual recommendations, but the people that are actually doing the late, the work, the emotional and the, uh, and, and the, you know, the act, the and intellectual and, and, you know, lobbying and the, the, all of the action, all of the labor on this is, is, is um, um, it's the families um, that are doing this work. Um, and I find that inexcusable. Um, and again, that's just um, one example, but there were um, recommendations, for example, in relation to the decriminalization of many other, you know, petty offences. And, and yet, what do we have today? We have, um, you know, states such as Western Australia with, um, you know, saying that, you know, um, that you can 
um, the um, fines and um, unpaid fines, um, you know, acts which say that um, um, someone can be incarcerated for not paying fines. So, like, and you know, what kind of why why did, would anyone who who's can't pay a fine be in prison? You know, one of the recommendations was about prison as a last resort. Like, how much of a, of a threat or danger does someone who can't pay a fine? I mean, that's just um, you know, I'm a middle class person. I've got a salary, so I can afford to pay them. But I mean, you know, there's other models. Like in New South Wales, there's a you know, you know, there's other ways. Like, there's, it's inexcusable that. Um, these laws still exist in, uh, and that's just one example in, you know, it's, it's inexcusable that there's um, draconian laws like the paperless arrests in the Northern Territory, um, where, whereas, you know, which, and that flies in the face of countless recommendations, the, you know, paperless arrest laws flies in the face of, um, you know, a, arrest as a last resort, imprisonment and as a last resort, and the need for accountability and oversight on police, not giving bowing down to the police union um, and allowing the police um, to um, have, you know, considering that police already have extraordinary powers, um, that, that to, you know, this, um, the purpose of the paperless arrest is, um, of course, to make the burden of administrative paperwork easy, easier for the police and, um, as I said, goes against countless recommendations in that report. Um, there's so many other examples, bail, um, the whole criminal, the whole carceral system um, in this country um, is really, um, you know, something that, um, you know, um, um, really is just um, captures the net of, of anyone who's Aboriginal, who's Black, who's poor um, and who's minoritised. And um, as I said, all of this is um, on the public record. You can and, and encourage people to go out and um, to, to look up um the Royal Commission, it's it's there. It was a, a document that was paid for by Australian tax dollars and it was written for the Australian public and, um, you know, encouraged people, you know, at this particular junction in time just to um, actually read, go through it and read the recommendations and to talk to your, um, you know, Minister of Parliament, to, to, look, to talk to your local MP, to talk to um, your family, to talk to, um, you know, local news media, so I asked Amanda her opinion, given that these recommendations are essentially all but unimplemented. Uh, was the whole Royal Commission a waste of time or what, what is its value still for us today? Now, she said, well, really, her opinion doesn't matter on that question. And she wanted to ask that question of people who were involved. So I did ask that question to Helen Corbett as well. As I said before, Helen Corbett was one of the, uh, one of the campaigners that pushed for that Royal Commission. And before she explains her opinion on, on the Royal Commission, I, I want to let her explain the context in which that campaign took place. During the 1980s, it was turbulent years for First Nations people at the federal ALP conference. The minister said that if they want government, for the next federal elections, they will introduce national land rights legislation in Australia. So everybody was on a great high throughout the continent, thinking that we would finally get what we always wanted, which we'd been campaigning for many decades. Uh, the promise was not kept. When Bob Hawke had won, despite the ALP getting a huge majority in the federal elections, with Prime Minister Hawke becoming the Prime Minister of Australia, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs at the time was Clive Holding, and he withdrew the promise because there was a lot of backlash from the mining companies and the ultra-conservative right to go forward with that policy. And so the policy was withdrawn and a very fierce, vicious, anti-Aboriginal anti campaign. So things were quite bad for achieving rights on any level, on any issue for First Nations people. 
I guess in a trailer, it seemed easier for the to turn its head towards an inquiry that would last well into the next period for a royal commission. So they decided to have this five-year inquiry into Aboriginal deaths in custody. One aspect of the campaign was to keep the focus on the racism involved and not just the technicalities of how people died. Our group were watching it like hawks and complaining along the way that it wasn't enough just to examine how long a piece of rope was that somebody had died from hanging or whether the, a bullet hole from a gun determined the death of somebody, that you had to look at the racism behind why somebody pulled the bullet and why someone in perfect health had died from medical reasons. So why did they push for a royal commission as such as opposed to some other form of inquiry? But they said they, and they offered to us to have a human rights inquiry. Um, we said, no, we don't want that because it was not compulsory for all players in the circumstances surrounding the death to come forward and give evidence. So you couldn't force police officers to come into the, the practice and provide information. And that happened in a lot of the cases. Whereas if you had a, a federal inquiry, you could force witnesses to the table. And so you got extra information by having the commission and not just a federal inquiry. So from Helen Corbett, was it all worth it? There's a range of responses to it. My own personal view is, yes, of course it was worth it because it was like the sleeping giant had arose from its sleepiness. First Nations people and non-First Nations people that rose up to defend our rights to basic human rights because but people realised that death in custody was not a black and white issue. It was a human rights issue. White people were dying in prison from the same issues. In fact, there were more people who, more non-Indigenous nations dying in custody. There was a higher numerical number of people dying, but it was just a pro rata. We were dying of higher non-First Nations people. There was a general racist overtone to why and how we were dying. And I, I want to return to the to the comments that Amanda Porter made when I asked her the same question. And I don't think my opinion really matters. I think at this time I kind of feel for those who um, did that work um, 30 years ago and I think about how they must feel um, and I think their opinion matters more than mine. Having said that, um, you know, from where I sit, you know, here in Nam, Melbourne, um, you know, on uh, this day in this particular point in time, um, I, um, I think it's a useful document to hold um, various Australian, um, to, to, to hold various elements of the Australian apartheid state um, to, ac to, to account over this in terms of the inaction. I think, um, you know, um, that's my humble opinion is that it, it is a, a useful document because it does, um, um, you know, you can, it can be used in this way to hold the, me the Australian apartheid media to account, to hold the um, Australian, um, uh, you know, apartheid police force to account. Um, and to ask these questions that we need to be asking now, particularly, you know, now more than ever, because we're seeing such dramatic increases in deaths in custody, but also, um, you know, um, um, it, it's, um, um, we need to be having these conversations about, you know, how is it that um, 
30 years later, um, there hasn't been, um, in spite of recommendation 224 and 222 about the importance of self-determination and actually funding Aboriginal um, organisations, how come we've seen an increase in police funding? How come we've seen an increase in corrections funding? How come Australian um, governments, state and territory governments are, are so um, uh, addicted to um, to, to, to budgets, um, you know, that see, um, you know, here in Victoria, the announcement of 1,500 know, um, new police recruits, um, record budgets. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, new state of New South Wales, it's the same um, record, 4.4, um, I believe, billion dollars for the New South Wales police force. Um, we, um, you know, there's criminologists who can even um, the most conservative of criminologists, such as um, Don Weatherburn, um, has written a book, Vanishing Prisoner, which shows that over the last uh, 20 years, there's actually been a, uh, a decrease in um, crime rates um, across various um, categories of offences. And yet we have, you know, ex ex expanded prison budgets. And um, in the state of New South Wales, for example, a, a, a record... Um, contract, um, the biggest contract in Australian history for the biggest prison in Australian history, which is um, currently um, opened um, in uh, on Yagul, Gumbangi, Bunjalung country up in um, uh, Grafton, the Clarence Correctional Centre mega prison, a 1,700 bed facility um, that um, including, I believe, a 300 bed um, uh, for, for a women's prison as well. And that's a contract with Serco, um, the notorious um, uh, private company, private British company that, um, of course, profits off um, human misery um, and has all of the Commonwealth contracts for um, um, de um, detention um, facilities. The point I'm just trying to make is that... Um, uh, you know, I think it's useful, um, in my humble opinion, to be able to, um, um, f for that, f for the purposes of advocacy and accountability, um, to be able to hold governments to account and to be able to hold um, Australian um, corporations to account, such as the Australian corporate media, about why they're doing nothing um, and why they're still um, getting it wrong why it is that you know they're not giving the space to um, have these conversations um, that we're having now and centering the experiences um, and the advocacy of, of families that are leading this fight across the country. The Australian Labor Party responded to the 30th anniversary of the Royal Commission by advocating a policy for increased funding for justice reinvestment. Now I asked Amanda about this the question of the current campaigns about uh, defund the police, prison abolition and or uh, justice reinvestment and especially about the latter, this is what she said. Uh, look, I've got to say I don't like either of these words. Um, can I just say why? And that is because justice reinvestment is a term that originated from um, Turtle Island um, in the US and, and it is, you know, from not, not uh, from, from the, from the US, you know, state. It's a term that comes from there. And I don't like that term because um, I think it's very specific to the history of how it developed over there. And it's something that I'm, um, you know, I've obviously read a lot about, but I don't um, understand, you know, what its history was from a local perspective. Um, and I'm just, you know, as someone who's, you know, like a policing historian and policing researcher, um, it's important to, to note that the you know policing is different here um, to how it is over there. P policing um, and police powers um, in the United States is you know by district, so they have the FBI, but then they also have like the LAPD. They have you know the New York Police Department and so on. So you know I don't and 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 that's the same for corrections. So it, it's a it's a district level um, thing. So I don't. Um, I don't think it, it's a term that travels over here because, you know, with they've, you know, and, and um, no disrespect to organise. I, I have the a world of respect for 
um, the Aboriginal community in Burke that are doing trials in justice reinvestment. Um, and um, I, um, you know, have, um, you know, a, a world of respect for the work that they're doing um, in terms of, um, you know, the same thing, the emotional labour, emotional black labour of um, um, and goodwill of Aboriginal communities leading um, fantastic initiatives. But the one thing that I don't think carries is the other end of it, the um, actual um, divesting from corrections and policing budgets. So I hope that makes sense. But the point I'm getting at is that, you know, um, and one of the problems I have with the term justice reinvestment is I just don't think um, I'm not satisfied that we've seen um, not, I, I've seen, I've seen um, Aboriginal community investment into local, um, you know, that, that just happens and that's a fact and you see that, you know, in, wh wh whichever, you know, Aboriginal community around, uh, um, around but we, we're not seeing the, the divestment, we're not seeing um, that, you know, because the concept of justice reinvestment is it's meant to be taking money from prisons and policing budgets and reinvesting it into, um, you know, other things. But I don't think that term um, um, carries well or translates here because, um, and that's my criticism of the term, is that it's just a bit clunky and um, it, we just don't, it couldn't be further removed from the truth here in Australia. Like we've had, we've got a, you know, doesn't matter which state or territory, maybe with the sole exception of the ACT, there's been, you know, as I said, record budgets for corrections and for police. So I'm not satisfied that there's been that, you know, divestment um, in any state and territory. And so when I asked Amanda about the reality of decarceration and abolishing prisons, uh, this is the answer I received. But it's the thing is, it's a bad idea to ever make so, you know, it's a bad idea to m ever make um, policy around the worst case scenarios. Like, you know, um, like I, I could give a talk, wax lyrical about this. I don't know where to begin, but, you know, people, I think, um, you know, read about the worst things that happened because the, the Australian corporate media, media kind of love to put that on their page one. They love to tell a story about, you know, human misery and tragedy and, and demons and the worst of, you know, these kind of stories sell. Um, but that represents a really small, you know, you could, I could name on, you know, Ivan Milat, you know, all these cases, um, you know, but then you think like even someone like, you know, Pell, for example, isn't in prison, <laughs> you know, when, um, and I shouldn't laugh um, uh, because I think this is a truth that, you um, is really poorly understood by non-Indigenous Australians is that um, in terms of the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women um, and children, um, there are countless examples of missing Aboriginal women and children in, in every town, um, in, in, in the township of Burke, for example, two young girls um, who were um, killed by a non-Indigenous man. Look at the case of Lynette Daly, um, um, where my family's from, um, in in, in um, living in McLean. Um, he she was killed by a non-Indigenous man. Look at the case of Bowerville. Um, you know, three Aboriginal kids murdered, um, and there's only ever been one non-Indigenous suspect. And we see this. You know, every town has a story like this, um, and it's one of police inaction. Um, and um, not one of these uh, people, perpetrators, um, have, have ever been convicted. And, and this goes to issues at the heart of policing. Um, and, you know, again, like the Royal Commission, it's all um, there for, you know, Australians to read about. About um, there's I'd recommend um, the the documentary Innocence Betrayed by um, distinguished Professor Larissa Brent. Um, there's um, some really good investigative journalism um, by um, Amy McGuire and Martin Hodgson who do the podcast Curtain. I'd encourage everyone to read that. But um, these kind of you know when you scratch below the surface, um, you see that um, you know th that there's um, a lot of people who commit um, particularly heinous crimes against Aboriginal 
um, women and children are still walking free in this country. Um, and um, sadly, um, Australian prisons are full of black women who are also victims of crime, um, but who are misidentified as perpetrators because of racial biases and prejudices which exist within um, the police at a systemic level and also at an uh, interpersonal level. Um, and you see that very clearly, for example, with the death of um, Ms. Du, um, who um, of course was um, you know, a concerned family member called the police and, sh and she, um, you know, out of concern for her. And what happened, she was arrested. You know this death. Every single recommendation, um, not 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 um, not adhered to here. Um, so many examples, um, and there's um, considerable um, empirical, you know, work done here by uh, particular acknowledgement to Dr. Marlene Longbottom, who's done work on this, um, and many others uh, about the the ways in which the police misidentify or mislabel Aboriginal women as. Uh, perpetrators um, and um, I can say um, here in the state of Victoria and um, that you know the example of the Clarence Correctional Centre mega, uh, mega prison with the 300 new bed that will be filled with 80% at least Aboriginal women none of those women need to be there um, and um, you know I <sighs> And I think the same goes for, uh, it's not just women, the same thing goes for, for, for um, all prisons. I think um, even, um, you know, prisons are full of um, people who um, are, are on remand. Um, as again, especially, especially Aboriginal people, but all, lots of people who just can't afford um, to pay, um, who, who are there just because of, you know, mindless, dumb carceral processing. Um, and I think, you know, it's, you know, inexcusable that, you know, like, oh, there were all these recommendations, there's recommendations about this in the Royal Commission about bail, about remand, about, um, and, uh, um, you know, there's 11, 11 of those 99 deaths um, with, uh, regarded, um, in regard to female um, deaths in, in police custody. None of those women needed to be there. You know, none, none of those 99 needed to be um posed a threat to anyone like I, i'm um and you know for these reasons i call myself um um a, a, a police um abolitionist and i certainly believe in the need to um abolish police unions um the need to um divest and to defund policing budgets and the need to defund corrections budgets um especially at this time you know when um we're having conversations about, you know, austerity and, you know, um, you know, um, um, budgets and, you know, not being able to fund, you know, and it's funny, like, I think, um, you know, everyone thinks it's a really um, radical idea, but, you know, as someone who's working in the education sector, it's just like, well, you know, we've been defunded for the last, you know, um, you know, God knows, like, I mean, you know, but, um, um, you know, and I think um, that's something that people need to remember is that, um, you know, um, it's time to be, um, you know, especially during COVID and the climate crisis, thinking about um, what to do with um, precious, um, you know, use of uh, and, and fair use of um, Australian taxpayers' dollars. And if there's one spot where there's some fat that can be cut, um, it's um, with police and corrections. Well, that brings us to the end of this current episode of The Green Left Show. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. A big thank you to Amanda Porter and Dr Helen Corbett for, for joining us as well. Uh, I once again want to apologise for this episode being so late and to, uh, you know, to emphasise that we will be returning to our weekly schedule. So please stay tuned for future episodes coming out. We'd love to hear your feedback about the topics that you'd like to see covered or, uh, you know, or, or other, any other feedback that you've got. Also, I would like to emphasize that if you do support the work that we do, please become a paid supporter of Green Left. It makes an absolutely huge difference to this project, to the campaigns that we're able to wage. Plans start from just $5 a month, and there's a link in the description below, uh, so you can uh, easily get involved in that. Um, and also, without paying a single cent, you can help us build the audience for this show by sharing this episode, uh, giving it a thumbs up, whichever platform that you're watching it on,
Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you next time.